country's first independent television news station. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Global outrage over the United States' efforts to spy on the world continue to mount. The Electronic Privacy Information Center filed an emergency petition Monday asking the U.S. Supreme Court to halt the National Security Agency's collection of millions of phone records. Also on Monday, the London-based Privacy International filed a lawsuit over alleged spying of, on Internet and phone users in Britain. And Brazil, meanwhile, launched an investigation into whether telecommunications firms operating in the country Country, cooperated with the United States. Over the weekend, the o Global newspaper revealed Brazil was the top target in Latin America for the NSA's global intelligence gathering effort. This is Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff. It is definitely a violation of sovereignty, without a doubt, just as it is a violation of human rights. Now we have to see without rashness or prejudgment. We have to investigate. Brazil's position is very clear and very strong. We do not agree in any way with these kinds of interferences, not just in Brazil, but in any country. The report about U.S. surveillance in Brazil was based on leaks by Edward Snowden, the former intelligence contractor who leaked secrets about the U.S. spy program to The Guardian and The Washington Post. Snowden remains at a Moscow airport while trying to obtain asylum. Three countries have offered to protect him so far, Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua. On Monday, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro confirmed he'd received Snowden's official asylum request. We received an application letter for asylum from Snowden. He will need to decide when to fly here, if he definitely wants to fly here. The fact is that Latin America is humanitarian territory, and it's growing every day. This would be probably the only humanitarian asylum or political asylum that would be given collectively in history. There are already a couple of countries participating. This is a collective humanitarian asylum in which the territory of our Latin America, which is always human, says to the young man, you are always being persecuted by the imperialist. It's best to come here. We turn now to NSA leaker Edward Snowden in his own words. In a newly released video, Snowden claims the National Security Agency gathers all communications into and out of the United States, despite NSA claims that it only targets foreign traffic. Snowden also predicted the U.S. government would seek to demonize him and accuse him of aiding America's enemies. Snowden conducted this interview on June 6 in a Hong Kong hotel room just before he was revealed as the NSA leaker. He was interviewed by Glenn Greenwald of The Guardian. It was filmed by journalist Laura Poitras. Have you given thought to what it is that the U.S. government's response to your conduct is in terms of what they might say about you, how they might try to depict you? I think the government's going to uh, to launch an investigation. I, I think they're going to say I've committed grave crimes. I've you know violated the Espionage Act. Uh, they're going to say you know I've I've uh, aided our enemies in um, in making them aware of these systems. But that that argument can be made against anybody who uh, who reveals information uh, that that points out mass surveillance systems, uh, because fundamentally they apply equally to ourselves as they do to our enemies. When you decided to enter this world, did you do so with the intention of weaseling your way in and becoming a mole so that you could one day undermine it with disclosures, or, or what was your perspective and mindset about it at the time that you first sort of got into this, this whole this whole realm. No, I, I joined the intelligence community when I was very young. Uh, sort of the uh, the government as a whole. I enlisted in the army uh, shortly after the invasion of Iraq, uh, and I believed in the goodness of what we were doing. I believed in the nobility of our intentions to free oppressed people uh, overseas. But over time, over the length of my career. Uh, as I watched the news, and I increasingly was exposed to true information that had not been propagandized in the media, uh, that we were actually involved in misleading the public, and misleading all publics, not just the American uh, public. 
in order to create a certain mindset in the, the global consciousness. And I was actually a victim of that. Um, America is a fundamentally good country. We have good people with good values who want to do the right thing. But the structures of power that exist are working to their own ends to extend their capability at the expense of the freedom of all publics. Can you talk about what you think some of the most important primary documents are and what they reveal? Um, the, the, the primary disclosures are the fact that uh, the NSA doesn't limit itself to foreign intelligence. It, it collects all communications that transit the United States. Uh, y there are literally no um, ingress or egress points anywhere in the continental United States uh, where communication there enter or exit without being monitored and collected and analyzed. Um, the Verizon document uh, speaks highly to this because it, it literally lays out they're using an authority that was intended to be used to seek warrants against individuals, and they're applying it to the whole of society by basically subverting a corporate partnership uh, through major telecommunications providers, and they're getting everyone's calls, everyone's call records, um, and everyone's internet traffic as well. Uh, on top of that, you've got Boundless Informant, which is uh, sort of a, a global, um, global auditing system for the NSA's intercept and collection system that lets us track how much, uh, how much we're collecting, where we're collecting, uh, by which authorities, and so forth. Um, the NSA lied about the existence of this tool uh, to Congress uh, and to specific congressmen uh, in response to um, previous inquiries about their surveillance activities. Beyond that, we've got PRISM, uh, which is a demonstration of how the U.S. government co-opts uh, U.S. corporate power to its own ends. Uh, companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, Microsoft, uh, they all get together with the NSA and provide the NSA direct access to the back ends of all of the systems you use to communicate, to store data, to put things in the cloud, um, and, and even just to, to send birthday wishes and keep a record of your life. Uh, and they give NSA direct access that, that they don't need to oversee so they can't be held liable for it. Um, I, I think that's a dangerous capability for anybody to have, but particularly an organization that's demonstrated time and time again that they'll work to shield themselves from oversight. Was there a specific point in time that you can point to when you cross the line from contemplation to decision making and commitment to do this? I grew up with the understanding that the world I lived in was one where uh, people enjoyed a sort of freedom to communicate with each other in privacy without it being monitored, without it being measured or analyzed or, or, or sort of judged by these, these shadowy figures or systems uh, anytime they, they mention anything uh, that travels across public lines. Uh, I think a lot of people of my generation, anybody who grew up with the internet, that was their understanding. As we've seen the internet and uh, government's relation to the internet evolve over time, we've seen that sort of open uh, debate, that free market of ideas sort of lose its domain and be shrunk. But what is it about that set of developments that makes them sufficiently menacing or threatening to you that you are willing to risk what you've risked in order to fight them? I don't want to live in a world where everything that I say, everything I do, everyone I talk to, every expression of, 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 of creativity or, or love or friendship is recorded. And, and that's, not, uh, that's not something I'm willing to support, it's not something I'm willing to build, and it's not something I'm willing to live under. Uh, so I, I think anyone who opposes that sort of world has an obligation to act in the way they can. Now, I've watched and waited and tried to, to do my job in the, the most um, policy-driven way uh, I could, which is to, to wait and allow other people, you know, wait and allow our leadership, our figures to sort of uh, correct the excesses of government when we go too far. But as I've watched, I've seen that it's not occurring. And in fact, we're compounding the excesses of prior governments and making it worse and more invasive. Uh, and, and no one is really standing to stop it.
That was part two of NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden's interview with The Guardian. It was conducted on June 6 in Hong Kong. Journalist Laura Poitras filmed the exchange, and Guardian columnist Glenn Greenwald with Laura asked the questions. You can go to our website and also link to the first part of uh, the interview. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We'll be going to Quito to speak with Ecuador's foreign minister, Patino, to ask about the latest around Snowden, around the downing of the flight of Evo Morales, forcing him down in Austria, what happened a few days ago. And we'll also ask him about Julian Assange.